that. So with that introduction, um, Bill will shepherd you on a discussion of peer review and give you some really very good practical ideas on how to do this. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. Welcome, everybody, and uh, belated Happy New Year. I hope everybody's semester's off to a really good start. Mine's off to a wonderful start because I'm on sabbatical and uh, living in Colorado. I'm leaving back for Colorado tomorrow, so this is my last gig before I head back. So I'm happy to be here with you. Um, I'd like to know something from you right off the bat. What's your interest in peer review? What, what, why do you want to know about peer review? I, I could have, from my point of view, I, I suddenly have to review the teaching assistants in our department. Okay. And I... I have no idea how to do it. Okay, great, that, great, so. great. I'll give you some really practical advice on that. Yeah. Um, I tell people I've got the best job in the university because what my job is in the psychology department is I teach graduate students to become faculty members, how to become professors. And part of that is to work really closely with them on their teaching. And I do, I do probably close to 100 observations a year with graduate students. And I have a lot of fun with it. And it's really beneficial to them. So it's really good. So I really appreciate the job you're going to do for those folks. So you can really make a big difference in how they see the world. Absolutely. Thank you. Other ideas? Okay. Please. I'm older than you, but I started when I was five. So. <laughs> um, I'm the chair of the Mentor and Peer Review Committee at the Clinical Science at the Best School. Oh, great. And our goal is to, again, help the young assistant professors to progress at an early age so they get on track for all their missions, whatever their assignments. Absolutely. That, and that's a, that's a really good uh, platform, I think. One of, the two things that the literature shows is that the, the earlier you can get a hold of somebody who's going to be into the academy and get the, all their teaching ducks in a row, the quicker they get all the other ducks in a row once they're on the job. So the best place, actually, to start is in graduate school, is to work with, with what you're doing, is working with graduate teaching assistants and get them so they know how to design a class, how to prep a class, how to teach a class. And then when they get that first job, they're ahead of everybody else. I can't tell you the number of horror stories I've heard from people who have not had any teaching and training while they're a graduate student or early assistant professor, and just how long it took them to get up to speed on their research program. Absolutely. And you wouldn't think about that. And major professors never think about it, because all major professors can see is they're like this, in that, that tunnel vision where all they can see is, let's get out the research, let's get out the research, not thinking about when they get that first job out there, they're going to also have other responsibilities as well. So you're doing important work on that. That's very, very good. Anybody else? Please. Bill and Nancy know from the library, we routinely conduct peer reviews of our tenured library faculty members. So good for you. People that have been in the classroom teaching for 10, 15, Absolutely. 20 years. Absolutely. Good for you. Um, like Jim said, I've been here for 30 years. And I'm still finding new and better ways to teach. It, it never ends. And it's amazing. You get a fresh pair of eyes in the classroom to watch you teach, and they can point out things to you that you'd never even dreamed that you were doing. Some of them you're doing well, much to your surprise. And some of them it's like, oh, I can't believe I'm doing that. I'm so glad you caught me on that. So it's very beneficial. So good, good job. So, so we got some different perspectives here, looking at peer review from different angles. Anybody else? Hi. Would you like to join me up front here? Because there's... You can have a, one of these uh, inner sanctum okay. type of You're chairs. No, don't worry about it. As far as being late is concerned, this is absolutely nothing in terms of what <laughs> what we're used to. See, I may be one of those four stories we were talking about. Um, I'm a new faculty in computer science. Okay. And, uh, my graduate program is very research focused, so I'm used to giving presentations at conferences, but. Um, I've got undergrads now, and you know it's a very different audience. And absolutely. I'd like someone to tell me what I'm doing wrong now, rather than you know. To oh, me. absolutely. Are, are you all along those lines? Are you aware that the Bigio Center does peer consultation at no charge? Uh, this is good. Yeah, they they come in and it, in general, what they like to do is come in and watch you teach for 25, 30 minutes, and then they like to talk to your students afterwards. And I'm gonna I'm gonna take you through the Bigio Center process today as we're talking, so you're familiar with it. Um, I've done a lot of peer review. I've read a lot about peer review. And I don't think that there's a better system out there than what we use here at the Bigio Center. It's really effective, particularly if you've got somebody motivated like yourself who are really interested in, ch in changing. So it's good. It's good. Please. Is the Bigio Center peer review also available for GPAs? Uh, Imad says yes. Yeah. So 
In fact, in fact, Ahmad directs the peer review program here. We, we try to finish them about midway through the semester, or is it a little bit afterwards? Well, it starts from the fifth to the ninth week. Okay. But sometimes we get a little bit late request, but we still are. Okay. We don't turn anything. Yeah, and we have, there are some really good peer reviewers. Uh, uh, I mean, everybody now, I would imagine most people have done 50 or 60 of them. So they really know what they're talking about. They're really good. And they're very eagle-eyed. They can come in and in just a few minutes really sort of get a really good idea where you're going and where you're headed with it. So it's very good. Um, so if you, uh, we believe, we hold the philosophy at the BGO Center that the sooner you can get any kind of evaluation, whether it be a student evaluation or a peer review evaluation, the sooner you can get that in the semester, the more you can benefit your students for that class. Because when you think about it, think about how most people do it including Auburn University, student evaluations at the last minute, OK? And what happens there is that you, you may get some interesting feedback there, but it's of absolutely no benefit to those students you've taught for the last 16 weeks. But what you want to do is get the class improved as you're actually teaching through it. So I always tell um, people that, really, you want to get sort of your first evaluation from your students about a third of the way through the course or after your first major examination. So they've got a, a feel for you from all dimensions, what you're like as a lecturer, as a class presenter, how you interact with the class, what your exams are like, those kinds of things. So, And I've really seen this really change the way instructors go about their teaching. It it's just can be really, really powerful. So, Anybody else? Yeah, I'm Please. a PhD student, and this is the first semester that I'm teaching. Ah. I really like to know what is it that the reviewers will be evaluating. Good. Very good. Good. So you want to you want to find a way to cheat, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. I know what the criteria are. Right. Well, what will happen is is that depending upon um, who might be reviewing you, the criteria might be be different. Now, at the Biggio Center, we basically all come from the same platform. We all work the same way. And I'm going to give you two handouts today that will give you some really good clues of what's really key that you need to be focusing on in the classroom. So that will help you a little bit. Yeah, I was just going to say I'm the, the part of the new faculty teaching uh, program. And I, I think one of the requirements is to do this video center peer review. Right. I didn't know anything about it, though. <laughs> I did it last semester, and I didn't. And I, I have to do it this okay. semester. So, I this so you're fulfilling a requirement. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I want to learn about it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, good, good. Um, anything else anybody wants to? Ask or contribute, please. I have taken the peer review for, from Vegas Center last semester uh, after the midterm. So it, you can do it in two ways. The first one is the way you talk about. Right. The second one is you can create a link and let your student to take uh, like online questions right. and try to give you feedback. I take the second way because I don't want to waste my class time, but it turns out I should take the first way. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely, it be definitely benefits me a lot. And my evaluation go from 3.0 to 5.6. Very good. For that semester. Yeah. And the another thing is, if you hear from students, actually, you've got a chance to clear things up. The students say, why do you go over so many proofs? The second one is, I think it's too fast. You can collect 26 people, 22 say it's too fast, 22 say it's okay, and four of them say it's too fast. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to change it, but you need to tell them, this is the right place. I'm not just paying no attention. Absolutely. Actually, they feel good about it, and they say, well, maybe I'm a little bit slow, and then we can spend more time mm -hmm. individually to mm -hmm. Make it, make it up. You're making a really good point, and, and, and I like it because you're saying that you initially thought it was a waste of time, but now you realize it's a really good investment. Even the one didn't took my <laughs> I think the first one would be much more efficient for right. some professional. Right. Good. The other thing I really appreciate about what you're saying is that you brought students into the picture. And that's important because for many students, this is the first time they will ever have any kind of significant dialogue with a professor about the educational process. And the, and the way we do it at the Biggio Center is we do it in small groups, sort of like small focus groups. So there, one group over here may have one emphasis, another group over here may have a different. And sometimes they're shocked that they're, they're so, world, so far apart. So it's a really great way to clarify things. So thank you very much. Well, let me go ahead and get started. I, I do have handouts for you, and I have handouts of all the slides. But I don't like to pass out my slides ahead of time because I don't like to give away the punchline. Um, so I want you to sort of pay attention to both what's over here and then what I'm saying. And then I've got two other handouts. Um, these are like checklists. These are things that observers will be looking for when they come into the classroom. One is actually a, um, 
a modified course evaluation, but it deals with specific teaching behaviors. And we cannot change a personality. That's not where we start when we talk about changing how people teach. We take a look at the actual behaviors that they're emitting in the classroom. That's where the real change takes place. You make enough of those changes, and then what happens is that the perception of the teacher's personality then shifts in the eyes of the student. Okay. Well, let me, um, let me go ahead and get started here. Uh, I always like to start with a quotation and, and some goals. So here's our quotation for the day. And this is the spirit of peer review. This quotation comes from um, a series of interviews I did with master teachers in psychology about the importance of learning from others, what you're doing well in the classroom and what could be improved. Always ask for feedback, even when it may not be what you would like to hear. Why, you know, why are we so afraid of that? Think about it. We're, a lot of us are really afraid of that. Be grateful for your most vocal critics. They may enable you to realize something that you need to know. Think of your PhD programs. Think about how important feedback is to you in your growth as a researcher. Now, all the editing that your major professor and your committee does, all these things benefit you as a young professional. The same spirit is true in teaching. This is, this is what we want to do. We want to look at this. In a, do you all know the difference between formative assessment and summative assessment? Okay. Formative means for your own benefit. That the only reason that we want to give you feedback is so that you can take it for what it's worth and improve. Summative is where that information is going to be used to evaluate you. And this is what professors are really afraid of. They are afraid that their teaching evaluations, their peer reviews, will be used against them to make them look bad so they won't get tenure, they won't get promotion, and they won't get a pay raise. So what we're saying, though, is that you cannot get to those points where you're going to be really functioning at a high level as a teacher without also getting some feedback. We're going to just assume you don't know anything about peer review. We're going to start the basics. And some of it's going to be really basic. And I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence, but I want to get everybody on the same page here. Okay? Uh, we'll throw out some guidelines about how to do this. There are, there are lots of different ways to do peer review. The worst way is for me to say, hey, Ahmad, uh, I'm teaching this class. Why don't you come over and watch me? Now, Ahmad and I go back a long time, and we're very close friends. And he's the last person I want in my classroom to offer me advice because we have a social connection. And what may happen is he may not want to hurt my feelings if he sees me doing something that's really horrible in the classroom. So I'm not going to get really good honest feedback from him. So you want to get somebody who's going to be not tied with you emotionally or strongly social. If we have time, and I want you to know I've never made it through this talk before, and I've given it many times. Um, I want to practice something with you. Okay? We're going to practice the, the thing that you were talking about that was called small group instructional feedback, which is really, really a lot of fun to do. So I'll try not to rush. So, but I would like to have time if we can, we can find the time. Anybody need to leave at 1 o'clock? OK, good. So we're all here for between 1.15 and 1.30. Oh, good. This is wonderful. Thank you. So let's, let's do a basic definition first, get, us, get ourselves where we want to be. Peer review involves a peer who's going to be put in a position to provide you feedback for only one purpose, and that's to improve whatever it is the, the peer is doing. Peer review in a journal, to improve the quality and the final product of a manuscript that will eventually be published in that journal. For teaching, it's going to do two things. It's going to improve your performance as a teacher for the ultimate benefit of what? Student, student learning. Enhancing student learning. That's the bottom line. Now. Some of you will see this little tilde. That's the cue to me that I'm done with that slide. I sometimes get so excited in my teaching and stuff that if I, I don't know what's on the next slide, and so I'll just start talking like crazy. So this reminds me now that I've got to take time to change subjects. Many people ask me that, so I thought I'd tell you in advance. So these are the primary purposes of peer review. What we tend to think of is really only the top one. Okay? That is fundamentally there to improve classroom practices, and it is. But it has larger and I think more significant benefits than simply working at the individual level. If you get enough people doing this in a department, in a college, in a university, then you begin to have a really nice cross dialogue about the value of teaching. So the, the teaching itself, 
discussions about teaching yourself spill over from the classroom into coffee breaks, into lunches, into breakfast, and those kinds of things. And so what happens is everybody's now thinking about how we can help each other improve the quality of teaching. So I really like this last one as sort of a collateral benefit, residual benefit of the peer review process. It really is about creating a culture that values teaching. And we all know that we're at an R1 university. Okay? And we know sort of where the, where the rewards are. And many of those rewards fall only in, into the research realm. But yet we have this huge, huge responsibility to our students. So the, the idea is, is that to function well as a researcher, but to also function at least equally well as a teacher. Okay? And that way everybody benefits. There are six phases of peer review. Now, I'm going to go into this in more detail later on, but I'm just going to give you just a quick review of it right now. Peer review starts when the peer reviewer contacts the person to be reviewed. Okay, it's usually a phone call or an email. Phone call is preferred. But what you have to remember is, in many cases when you're doing peer review, the person being reviewed is nervous and uncomfortable. So as a peer reviewer, it's important from the get-go that you establish good rapport with that individual who you're going to review. I can't tell you the number of people that I will walk into their office and I can just sort of see them almost shaking. Because they're afraid of what? They're afraid of being evaluated. So you've got to sort of nix that in the bud right away. So when you're working with those graduate students in your department, they're all going to be anxious about it. And what you need to do is let them know it's going to be okay. And it is. It will be okay. So we start with the contact, and then we go with a pre-class meeting. Now, the way a lot of times peer review is done is you simply say, hey, okay, we're going to set up an appointment. I'm going to show up at your class, and that's it. Okay, that's it. And then maybe I'll sit with you a few minutes afterwards, and we'll talk about what I saw. This is a much more structured, formal, and beneficial way of doing this. I want to meet with the teacher ahead of time because I sort of want to know what his or her head is like. Okay, how do you approach teaching? Can I see a copy of your syllabus? Okay. Do you have some student learning objectives that you've already written out for what, we're going to, what I'm going to see tomorrow when I observe your class? So I want to get an idea of where this person is coming from in terms of his or her teaching. And that allows me to do that. It also allows me to put that person at ease. Okay. Because if you approach it very informally rather than stiff, formal, I'm going to evaluate you, you will suffer as a result. That's what they're thinking. Okay. You need to sort of Try to put a different mindset in place. <coughs> then there's the actual observation that we at the Beagle Center combine with a meeting with the students. Uh, and this is pretty fun. It's really fun. Even if you don't do an official peer review, one of the things you may want to do to improve your teaching is to ask your colleagues who have very good reputations for being excellent teachers on this campus, ask them to come and ask if you can come and watch them. Bring a notebook, take notes, steal every good idea they have, and it's okay. This is how people get better. This is what teaching conferences are all about. People giving away their ideas because they want to benefit the culture as a whole. Um, we like to prepare an actual written report so the individual has something tangible in his or her hands after the observation. And then the post-observation meeting simply is meant to summarize and discuss what's written in the post-observation report. But those are the basic six steps. Uh, as a reviewer, it probably takes me uh, maybe three to four hours to do this right. So realize it's a small investment of your time. I mean, it is a significant investment. It's going to be a big investment of your time doing all those GTAs unless you have a team that you can, you can create to share in that workload. How long does it take you to do a do one of these, Samad? Well, um, it depends on when you start the uh, setting the appointment and then you join the pre observation. That will take about thirty minutes to about an hour. In the, the classroom decision itself, it will be about an hour, and then a meeting during, during which we have also meeting with the student, and then you prepare a report. So maybe about you could say total about twenty four hours. Well, that's how much the whole time course, but yeah. in terms of actual work on your part. The actual work, probably about four hours. Three or four hours. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, 
peer review has a lot of critics. Most of the comments that you're going to hear are pretty much unfounded. But I want to take you through them so you know what they are. The first is, who qualifies as a peer? Okay. Now, if you're a full professor, sometimes you get a little touchy about an assistant professor coming in and doing a uh, peer observation. Because why? They obviously cannot be as smart as you. Okay. Okay. They just can't. Can't be. So there's some controversy about this. The, the related to this is peer in terms of what? Peer in terms of content? Or peer in terms of um, what they know about pedagogy? Okay. Ideally, you want to have somebody who knows your content area and who also is very sound pedagogically. Okay. What qualifications should I have as a peer reviewer? What qualifies me to do a peer review? My belief is that to do peer review right, you need training. You need practice. Those are going to be the best peer reviewers. And what you're getting today is sort of just a, a smidgen of that. What we really need to do, if you're interested, is to set up a workshop where you're actually about it. You take about an afternoon, about four hours, and where we actually practice <coughs> doing peer reviews. And, getting, and you get feedback on your ability to peer review. This is a touchy part for a lot of faculty. Is the outcome confidential? And as I'll say in a few minutes, it is key. It is key. You have to know that you can trust the peer reviewer. What's the purpose? This is where we get to that formative, summative distinction that we were talking about earlier. Is the peer review process in effect, in, in, uh, effective in improving teaching? Is it worth the time? And I will tell you the answer to both those questions is yes. But only in the hands of a qualified peer reviewer. Okay. It's just like anything else that you're going to do well. You need to be trained. And you need to have some understanding of what's going on. And then, as you'll see, peer review is a pretty complicated process when you get down to what it takes to be good at the process. Any questions so far? Here's one of our outstanding peer reviewers, Dr. Raj. How are you doing? Good. Good. So what we're going to do now is going to talk about what it takes to be a good peer reviewer. Okay. And I want to emphasize again, this is not something you just have somebody do. A lot of times, you have a chair who comes in and watches you teach. That chair may or may not know what he or she is talking about. You have to realize that. I've had peer reviews by chairs in the past, and I go in to sit down, and the chair says, you know, you did OK. You did good. Thanks. And that's it. No insight, OK? No questions, no, no pre-observation meeting at all, no written report. It was simply there because the chair, it says in our bylaws that everybody has to be peer reviewed by the chair once every, I don't know, 25 years, something like that. Got to be trustworthy. Got to be trustworthy, absolutely. Got to know something about what, what, what is good pedagogy? What makes a good teacher? What makes an effective instructional method? Most people don't know the answer to this question. Your technical experts were oh, yeah. not teachers. Right. Very good point. She said, we're technical experts, we're not teachers. Many, many people think that just because you have a master's degree or a PhD behind your name, that you're qualified to teach. You're not. And you can probably testify to that, that it is, it is really difficult to be a good teacher. And that's why you're here. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's where we all start. Okay. Keen powers of observation. You have to watch the little details of what the professor is and is not doing, and at the same time, pay attention to what the students are doing. Because there are some times that students are doing things that the teacher is not aware of. That could make a big difference. I sat in a, I did a, a peer, observ peer observation about, a, I guess it was about a year ago now. And I always sit right where you guys are sitting. This is the best place to sit. Because from here, you not only can see what I'm doing up here, but you can see everywhere around you. So you can see what people are doing. Okay? You know? 
she got her cell phone out. Is she texting? Okay. Those kinds of things. And it's the funny thing is about texting, a lot of times professors don't, don't catch texting. But the student sitting around the person does, and it bothers those students. Okay? Because they want to pay attention, but yet they're distracted. Anyway, I was observing this teacher. I won't mention his name. And um, for 45 minutes, like a spigot that's turned on, the teacher droned on. Okay? Made eye contact over here and over here, but never paid attention to about this part of the classroom back. So there was a woman sitting right about here, and she had her computer out. And I was able to see whatever she was doing on the computer. And she never once, ever, paid any attention to what the professor was doing, didn't take any notes, but instead was doing online, shop online shopping. Okay? She was looking at boots and scarves and all sorts of things like that, getting ready for the winter. And she got her credit card out, and she was typing in numbers and ordering stuff like this. Okay. The professor never knew that, okay, because the professor had never paid attention. So this is a very valuable bit of feedback I was able to give him. Okay? And then when I went back in to watch the same class later on, he was much more proficient at making eye contact around. And he moved around a little bit more. Rather than staying captured behind the podium, okay, we're, we're secure back here because nobody can see our legs shaking. Okay? So what happened was he was able to get around and make eye contact, and the woman had her computer out, but she was taking notes. That makes a big difference. A little thing like that. A little thing. Think of the difference it might make to the student's uh, outcome in terms of learning and grade. <coughs> to be a good listener and a reflective speaker. So when you're sitting in a meeting and going over what you've observed with the teacher, you can't be really chomping the bit to provide <coughs> feedback. Okay? You have to sort of listen to what the, what's going on, and you have to watch the body language that's going on in this situation in order to sort of maximize the effectiveness of that feedback. So you see, it's not an easy thing to do. You've got to be paying attention to a ton of things that are going on. You have to have decent social skills. You have to be, you have to be um, interested in what other people are saying and doing, and you have to reflect that in your body language and in your behavior, okay, and what you're saying. Uh, I saw three things that you really did lousy in the classroom. You really screwed up, and your students are suffering as a result. That's not a good, good approach, okay? It's definitely not a good approach. But yet you'll see, particularly chairs, who will provide that kind of feedback. Particularly if they have an ax to grind with you to begin with, okay? Finally, you have to be non-judgmental. You can't take a look at Raj over there and just size him up for what you think of him without actually seeing what he's like in the classroom. If you do that, you preclude a lot of things that you could say to him in terms of positive feedback. And as the person is interacting with you in the feedback session, this post-observation meeting, you have to also be very careful. You don't want to use strong authoritarian language. Okay? Bill, one thing that I sometimes do is somebody's doing something I really want to comment on, it's a really bad behavior, rather than providing my judgment to actually ask them, do you know you did such and such? Why did you do such and such? Why did you make that choice to do such and such? Mm -hmm. And I guess I think it makes it non-judgmental. Right. Absolutely. I, you know, and along those lines, a great way to open a feedback session is, so what do you think? What did you do well? And what do you wish you would have done better? So what happens is, you begin them, I mean, you begin the session putting them in a buy-in situation. Because you show them that you're really interested in what they have to say. And sometimes you can say, I, I noticed that too. I thought you were wonderful at that. That was, a, that was great. In fact, I'm thinking about taking that idea and putting it in my classes. I can't tell you the number of times where I've, I've been in these feedback sessions, and I've observed people teach, where I've learned something very, very nice about teaching, and that I now integrate into my teaching. So you know, always be on the lookout for good ideas. It doesn't matter what role you're playing. Always be on the lookout for good ideas. So these are sort of the kinds of qualities that good peer reviewers possess. Maybe not at the beginning of their training as a peer reviewer, but by the end. So those of us who train peer reviewers, these are the kinds of qualities we're trying to sort of instill in our, in our, in our folks. So let me talk a little bit about, about a few of those, OK? I cannot underscore this enough. 
the people that we're serving as peer reviewers for, for whom we're serving as peer reviewers, must understand that they can trust us. That if we're doing uh, a peer review, and we haven't been asked to do this by the department chair or the dean or somebody else, that this stays just between us. You know, when you bring the dean or an administrator in, it changes the whole nature of everything. And you can't say, you know, uh, you know, let's say Raj and I are colleagues, and let's say we've observed Ahmad teach. I can't say, Raj, you can't believe what a doofus Ahmad is. You should have seen what he did in the classroom. You'll find that some people who do peer reviewers, they'll do that. They'll sort of talk about what they've seen. And that sort of gives it all a bad rap. Okay, so you've got to be absolutely trustworthy. Now, here's the interesting thing. At the Big EO Center, we like to involve students in part of this process. And so some of you might say, but how are we going to keep this confidential with the students? Well, you're not. And you never will. But believe me, whatever we learn from students in our feedback sessions with the students, they're already spreading all over campus. Okay, They're already talking about you. But now you put them in a situation with a Big EO Center and doing it in a constructive, positive way to provide critical feedback to a professor. That's the difference. Students are always going to gab. And what's really interesting, I've, I've interviewed, hang on just a second, I've interviewed several students, talked to them about, I, I'll say to them, how did you choose which classes to take this semester? And from whom you decided to take them? Do you know what they all say? They say exactly the same thing. Anybody know what it is? My friend told me. No. RateMyProfessors.com. Really? Uh-huh. And if you take a look at, if, you, know, you know, I know we probably all look at ourselves on that. But take time to look at other professors, not just here, but across the country. And you'll find two things. The comments are ones of love and admiration or ones of hate and, and uh, despite. There's no middle ground, and there's almost no constructive criticism. Okay? But that's how students are making the decisions. Okay? This is bad. This is a bad thing. So, Imad. Yeah, I already said it's written my professor. Oh, right, my professor. Okay. okay. Place, it is. It is absolutely amazing. <coughs> In terms of the kinds of pedagogical knowledge that one really needs to possess, there are some minimal qualifications. For example, okay. What do we know about this teacher that we're observing in terms of how he or she prepares for the class? This is why that pre-observation meeting is important. Okay, because we can say, how did you prepare for this class today that I'm going to observe later on today or tomorrow? Okay, what do you do? Which, typically, what do you do? Because you could pinpoint teaching is not confined to the classroom. Think of everything we have to do to get prepared to go into that classroom, including the overall goals we have for the class that appear in the syllabus. Content and delivery, uh, content and delivery of that content, okay? That's the weakest part of the link. Because a lot of times when we do peer reviews, we're not content experts. We're delivery experts. I don't know anything about aeronautical engineering, but I've observed people in our aeronautical engineering teach. And I've talked to their students, okay? Uh, you have to know something about how to assess student learning. Because it's not just the delivery of information that we're about in terms of giving advice. We're also about how are students learning it? What are, do the tests actually reflect what you're trying to teach them? Okay. If there is no learning, there has been no teaching. What's the physical presence like? Does the teacher have any um, distracting mannerisms? Is there a sort of bias in the movement about the classroom and eye contact? What about the social present? How does a student, how does the faculty member, or the, the faculty member that you're observing interact with his or her students? Is it obvious that he or she has favorites? Is it possible that, you know, like in the earlier case I told you about, the faculty member is just facing one particular group? Think about the students you like sitting there in class, okay? You say something, you look at them, they, they nod their head. That's very reinforcing. And we tend to go back to those people all the time. Or people who smile at us as we walk by the classroom, okay? But these things have an impact on the rest of the class. I mean, think about, um, 
if I take Amy Sue here and I say, um, get out your cell phone for me, please. She's a, she's a student. And I said, please call your mother or your father for me and let them know that you're going to be unable to finish college because you're too stupid. Okay. <laughs> now, I have seen similar, I haven't seen those exact words, but I've seen similar things occur in the classroom. Now, that conversation is not limited to just the two of us. All of you just observe that. How does that make you feel about me? What is that, how does that impact what you're willing to do in the class for me as your teacher and for you as a learner? How willing will you be to raise your hand? Okay. So all those things generalize. So it's just not this. Okay. It's the whole kit and caboodle. It's everything. Um, what does the teacher do to promote learning? Are there activities in the class that you can you know, see by the syllabus that are low cost or low stakes that contribute to student learning and will enhance the summative assessments? That is, summative, summative assessments that are graded. Okay. Is there only a midterm and a final? Okay. What kind of feedback does the professor give on papers and essay examinations? Those kinds of things. Any questions about this? Now, the great thing is there is a lot of really super books on the market out there about pedagogy. I mean, there is just really a lot of really fine products. Almost every one of you in here will, will be in a discipline that publishes a teaching-related journal. You should look at those, browse through those. It's amazing what you can learn in terms of teaching particular classes, exercises you can bring into the classes, demonstrations you can bring into the classes, things like that. Okay, first couple of handouts. I'll start this one over here, and I'll start this one over here. Give you a couple seconds. I don't, we may need, uh, if you made 30 copies, we should have enough. More of those? These ones, yeah, the, the, the TBC? Okay. So I think there are more coming. So what we'll do is while we're waiting for copies of the TBC, let's talk about the other, the other handout. This is the checklist that I use when I observe faculty and graduate students teach. And I developed the first version of this back in 1985. And every year I revise it. Now, I've been doing this for a long time, but I don't remember everything that I need to look at because there are so many things going on. So I use this as a memorandum to help me figure out what it is that I need to make sure I pay attention to because these are the big items. Okay? And as you can see, what I've done here is I've created an evaluation instrument, an assessment instrument, rated from 1 to 5. 1 means very poor that, boy, there's a lot of work you need to do in this area. And five means you're pretty darn near perfect. I give very few fives. Okay. I give a lot of two, threes, and fours. I divided these into three, three basic areas. One is, what does a teacher do in terms of delivering the information to the students? Okay. Second is, Physically, how does the professor use his or her body as an instrument of teaching? That includes eye contact, uh, changes in voice inflection, all those kinds of things to emphasize points, hand gestures. And then finally, social presence. What's the social climate like? Teaching, first and foremost, foremost is social behavior. This is why students are so nervous. That's why they're afraid to raise their hand, because they realize other people are watching them. And how you respond to those students makes all the difference in the world in terms of their willingness to raise their hand again, and other students to observe that and to learn from it and say, this is a safe classroom environment. It, you know how easy it is to offend people. 
And sometimes teachers do things that are offensive to students that they just don't realize. They just don't realize it. That's the value of peer observation. You can point those kinds of things out. So I bring this with me every time. And as I'm, as I'm going through and observing, I make little uh, notes to myself. And I, I usually wait until about, oh, seven, eight minutes before I'm going to leave the observations, before I actually put the check marks down. But I'm making notes all over it. And sometimes I have to use the back. And this will help me form part of the basis for my written report that I will give the professor usually within 24 to 48 hours. So any questions about this? We need copies of the TBC. Thank you. Great. Because, as I said before, it's uh, difficult to evaluate the content of a topic. Right. Because if I go to whatever lecture here in campus, I will not be able to understand probably what they are talking about. Right. Because students are there, they're supposed to have the basis for that lecture. Whereas I'm like to review, I will not have the basis. So, how can evaluate the teacher if it's clear and he is uh, delivering the content? Okay. <laughs> Excellent question. Did everybody hear it? Okay. There's a couple of ways. One is you can take a look at how other students are reacting. And if you see scratches on the heads or the eyebrow, you know, furrowing, stuff like that, or you see anything that's sort of a, a gesture of confusion, you know they may not be getting the point across. Then, if you suspect that, when you talk with the students after the professor's done teaching, ask them, was the material clear today? Is, it, is, it, is the teacher a clear communicator? And you'll get some pretty honest answers back for that. So you can sort of help that way. The second thing is, is that this is more true of introductory level classes than senior level classes. But if terms aren't defined well, if um, uh, the teacher is introducing a new concept and just sort of going over it quickly, then those are hints as well. I like to look at myself as a learner in that class. And my feeling is, is I'm, um, I'm an intelligent layperson. I should be able to follow the bulk of what's going on in that particular class. And if I can't, I will raise some issues. And sometimes uh, I'll talk to the professor about that. I'll say, you know, there was a point here I really didn't understand. And I'll ask this to the teacher to explain it to me in that post-observation meeting. And I'll say, now I understand. I'm, then I'll say, I'm wondering if some of your students might have had a difficulty with that too, because I saw some confused looks on their face which will give the teacher pause to reconsider what's going to be said during the next classroom period. OK. Here's a very good question. Very good. Uh, just sometimes, <coughs> if I have like three a topic that I have to explain in three lecture, and I explain some concept the first hour, and then after two days, maybe I'm having the second lecture. But I know that many students have not studied what right. I said the first time. Absolutely. They're focusing on they have an immunology test. So yeah. They're going to wait one week. So yeah. is it that you're repeating everything OK? You just have to say, I have to move on, and they will have to catch right. up by themselves reading notes. Right. You have to feel like you've given them every opportunity mm -hmm. and no more time than that. Because you do. You have to manage your time wisely, absolutely. So, Other questions about this checklist? Please. What are uh, appropriate hand gestures? What <laughs> well, you know, if the hands are flying wildly like this all the time like that, that's going to be distracting. Mm -hmm. If um, there are uh, gestures that the teacher is making with the hands that, you know, like the, the teacher is constantly scratching at a location of the body, like a face. Sometimes when teachers are nervous, they have this kind of reaction. They don't realize that they're doing it. And so if you see it repeated throughout the course of the you know, half hour you're there or whatever, then you know that that probably is something that you need to mention in terms of possibly being a distraction. And you can ask your students, the, the, the professor's students, that question also. You know, uh, what about the mannerisms? I noticed that the teacher really spoke fast. Okay? And oftentimes, they, both hands were busy or down by the side. You know, how, how do you feel about that? Those kinds of things. So uh, you'll know an inappropriate hand gesture when you see it. Okay? And it doesn't mean anything profane. It simply means that there's either not enough of them or that they're just sort of lavish, just all over the place. Just like a teacher who paces back and forth. You know, they go, and they're very distracting. And then they, and they raise their rate of speech. You know, they'll be going back and like this. They're, they're anxious. You'll see this mostly in new professors. And so that's something that you would need to address too. So please. To what extent um, do peer reviewers 
generally say like, oh, I noticed the teacher spoke really fast, like, or do they let the students come up with themselves or like, I noticed that their hands were like, you know, we're doing this. Could that, um, or do they let the students say, oh, I noticed this too, or because if the, if the students didn't notice, it may be like now they'll suddenly pay attention and be bothered by it. Right. Very good question. Everybody hear that okay? Um, normally what I do is I start with a general statement. Um, I might say something like, um, how did you feel about the rate at which the teacher presented the information? So I don't, I'm not biasing it one way or the other, so it's not really a leading question, although it's getting them to focus. And then sometimes uh, students will say, oh, yeah, it was really fast. And then I'll say, is this typical of what the teacher's normally like? Because sometimes when I'm in the room, it'll make the teacher slightly nervous. And if they say the teacher doesn't usually talk that fast, then I know it's probably me. So then I won't even bother mentioning it to the professor. But if enough students say something about it and it seems to bother them, I'll say, you know, you may want to just work with um, working with your rate of speech, and they'll say, you know, I know that. I've tried. What do you suggest? And then I'll usually come up with a suggestion. And the normal suggestion there is that build questions into your PowerPoint slide that slow you down. It forces you to slow down, forces you to pause. How long does a typical professor wait after posing a question before he or she then answers that question himself or herself? Two seconds. <laughs> Two seconds. Because you can't stand that silence. It's like a bad date. Okay? But you have to get used to it. You've got to give time for things to sink into your students like that. Okay? Good questions. Please. When you have a peer review of teaching, and no big use center, the students are involved in this. If it is a, for instance, in the department, um, colleagues evaluated. Do you typically also allow time for the reviewer to talk with students? And how do you structure that? If you can? You're talking about in a departmental situation or if you have a big EO center? Would you use the students in a departmental situation? I, I think any time that you can put students in a situation that's safe to share their experiences with a peer reviewer, you're going to get a higher quality information in the end. Because a lot of times what happens is I can observe something. And then I'm going to depend on those, that student coming to put it in context for me. So it gives me a larger and more complete picture. Remember, I may be coming in on week eight, but the students have been there for the prior seven weeks. So now they're working with that large context, and they can give me a clue as to what's really going on there. So if you can do it in a departmental situation, I say more power to you. Is there any conflict of interest? Because the students probably know other faculty within that department. Uh, is there really a comfort level in that case? I, I think that if you have a group of faculty who are trustworthy, that and students usually know who those faculty are, that students would feel comfortable in that situation. And that, that's oftentimes when I suggest uh, at other universities doing a small group instructional feedback with students, that's often the first reaction. Or oh, the students won't like it. Well, the students love it. They love it. And sometimes they'll say, you know, this teacher doesn't need it, but that teacher really needs it. So you find out things about the department that you may not want to find out. So um, let's move on to the TBC. This is a teacher behavior checklist. And this is a um, empirically verified and psychometrically sound instrument for assessing uh, teaching. Uh, I'm not going to take you through the history of its development. It was developed here at Auburn University. Um, but let me just tell you about the instrument itself. It has 28 items. So if you notice at the far left hand, there's a number. Those numbers are not rank ordered in terms of importance. Those are just numbers. Then if you take a look at the larger, um, larger column, it starts out with a term like accessible or approachable. And if you go down, you'll see things like rapport, uh, those kinds of things. Those are qualities. You know, you're, you're good at time management, you have good rapport, you're approachable. But here's the question. How do you know when somebody's approachable? And is your definition of approachability the same as yours? This is the thing that gets me about regular student evaluations, is that students are defining the terms on those student evaluations differently because they have different experiences. So it may be approachable to me, may not be the same to you. Now if you take a look at what's in parentheses, you'll find actual physical behaviors 
that are demonstrable. Okay? We see them. So now what happens when students use this as a course evaluation instrument, they're all using the same definition to define the quality. And if I'm using this in a peer review situation, which I often do, not always, but often, then if a, if a student, if a teacher, let's say, is having problems with number, I don't know, how about 22? What's 22? Rapport. Makes class laugh through funny jokes, initiates and maintains classroom conversations, knows students' names, interacts with students before and after class. These are, these are data that were collected from students themselves. So these are student perspectives on these 28 qualities. So I can, I can talk to a teacher about his or her rapport with a class. And I could say, you know, I really didn't get a sense that you had developed a really good social connection with your students. And, and, and he or she will say, you know, I've tried, but I just don't know what to do. Well, I looked down at number 22, and I've got four or five different physical suggestions that I can give him or her right off the bat. Now, I can't make everybody a stand-up comedian, nor do I want to. I can't teach anybody how to have a sense of humor. But I can show them, you know, well, you know, if you've got any cartoons that are related to your discipline that make a certain point, you know, bring them in. Maybe there's something in the Sunday comics that really captures a point that you're trying to make. You know, you can bring that in. And students appreciate that. Why? It gets away from the dullness of the lecture a little bit. And it makes the point in a different way, one that they can often relate to. So these two uh, checklists really will speak to the idea of pedagogy. And I, I, I don't go anywhere without, this, without the uh, classroom checklist, without this checklist here. Okay. So you may be in a, in a situation in which the teacher is using PowerPoint and uh, the font's real small. That's a small little thing that we often overlook, but it has big consequences in whether the students can actually see it or not. That's another reason for being a peer observer and sitting in the back of the room. Can you hear the professor? Can you see the professor? Can you read the PowerPoint or whatever is on the board? I did a, uh, I was, uh, about six months ago I was over in the chemistry department and I was uh, doing a peer review for a, a chemistry professor and this professor was just right, almost microscopic. If you were in the front row, you could see it, but the back row couldn't see it. You know, little things like that really make a big difference. Sometimes students are afraid to say, could you write larger? You know, could you write larger? A lot of times you're in a PowerPoint situation where the professor is like this. Um, effective peer reviewers, pedagogical knowledge, the teacher behavior checklist, you have that in the handout. Uh, sample teaching observation form, uh, you also have that in a handout. Okay, good, let's move on. So what did you see there? I didn't take the time to explain anything. My back was to the audience. My voice was going this way. In a large classroom, the teacher may not be able to be heard because this is absorbing all the sound. These are things that a lot of teachers do, particularly older teachers who are using PowerPoint. They just don't have it. Okay, they just, they just don't get it. <clears throat> About, sorry. Oh no, don't about, apologize. Uh, moving the class, about what? Something. Moving around the Please. class, as you mentioned before, we have a gigantic new classroom and mm -hmm. there are people in the back that are shopping or oh, yeah. an email. But they are so big, the class, that I have the yeah. impression that if you yeah. start walking around, they will get everybody uh, motion sickness or... No. Know. You know, if you're sprinting back and forth, yes. <laughs> But I, I teach, um, up until this last semester, I taught uh, in a big classroom, 400 students. And I'm in the back row a lot. I'm making eye contact with them. I'm back there all the time. I always stop about halfway through the lecture. I say, how are you folks doing back there? You know, just to let them know I'm paying attention to them. They need to know that you are paying attention and that you like them. You know? So don't be afraid to take a walk. Always get out from behind this thing. These things are horrible. They're kind of taking a video. So yeah. Tell them, tell those guys to take a hike. Okay.
because they're interfering with the student's ability to learn from you. You're going to be a much more teacher when you're out here and you're dynamic and moving around. See, Please. you don't understand our situation. We have a policy that you don't have to come to class, or we have people that are learning from webinars, so we don't yeah. have a choice. We've got to yeah. be what they say, but it is a problem because we teach, all our courses are on a computer, so each person has a computer, and I would say our biggest problem when you're teaching, you have 130 students, they stay in the same room all day long, and they, they live there, they have their cushions and all, whatever, and they're, you don't know, you, you do have to walk around, or they're mm. uh, writing a novel or internet oh, yeah. shopping. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really a whole change of how you have to teach. Yeah, exactly. It's extremely stressful <coughs> to me, and I've been teaching a long time to have my... Uh, have well, you've been my, teaching since you were five. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, I didn't tell you how it was. <laughs> but, you know, she, I can relate. Yeah. And, and plus, we don't have anybody to teach us. You walk in and you're given a class mm -hmm. with 130 people and you're saying, okay, on Monday, this is the material you're going to cover. Right. I mean, it's extremely difficult. We Do you have courses where you teach people how to teach that are young people like GTA? Well, we have we have a number. Well, we do have a GTA fellows program in the Big Center. Uh, you know, if you haven't ever done this, go to the website, the Big Center website, and they'll outline all the programs. There are all sorts of individual consultation opportunities with the BGO Center. So if somebody really is interested in developing his or her teaching beyond where it is now, you know, you don't have to rely just on these PDS uh, seminars. You can come in and you can meet with people who are experts at this, and they can walk you through it. They can, we can do more than one observation a semester. So. And at what point, maybe it's just me that I'm doing that, because sometimes I'm thinking if you are in the back line and you're shopping, no, it's not kindergarten anymore. So right. you want to keep up, it's okay. Otherwise, yeah. it's your business. Yeah. You're going to do poor and test. You know, I do my yeah. test, but I cannot yeah. babysitting. I wouldn't call it babysitting. I would say educating them to what what being a student is all about. Um, there are a lot of professors, and I'm not saying you're one of these professors, who really don't think that they should have anything to do with motivating or inspiring teachers. But I will say in the end, that's the function of teaching. Because, you know, a lot of people get this from a book. But what makes a difference in most of our lives is somebody who took the time to care, to help us do it. All of us, uh, uh, Ahmad, me, Jim, we, we all can point to one or two teachers in our careers, undergraduate careers, who made a difference. And that's why we're here now. And those people, sometimes you influence them in the most tiny ways that turns out to be so significant. And a lot of times, you never know about it. Sometimes just taking enough time to say, look it, what are you buying there? Oh, yeah, I got one of those not too long ago. Okay, But you know, I do most of my shopping after class, and I really appreciate if you do the same. And sometimes that's all you need to do. How did you have that interaction with the student? I mean, even though you did it in a, a jokey, kind of friendly way, I, there's still everybody else who would have seen you call that person out. To Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. I mean, how, how does that not still sort of turn to the Oh, I'll tell you, it, it does not affect what they think of you as a teacher in terms of like hating you or something like that. Mm -hmm. What it does is saying that this is not an activity that's appropriate during class. And what I do in my class, the very first day of class, I, I read them the right act. It's the only day in my classes that I'm deadpan serious. And I let them know that, that you cannot use computers and other technology in the class inappropriately. Because if you do, this is what I'll do. And I usually do the example of the cell phone that I did with Amy Sue. Okay, I usually do something like that. And that usually gets a big laugh. And I'll say, you know, I'm not really doing this to be mean, but this is our time together, and I want you to maximize the opportunity you have at Auburn University to become a good learner. And if you're doing this, it's really interfering not only with what you're doing and what I'm doing, but there's a good chance that you're bothering people around you. In fact, when you take a look at uh, incivility, classroom incivility, Sometimes it's the students who are the most upset at the incivility as opposed to the professor. Okay? So always start, it's like an arms race. You know, you don't want to start by dropping the bomb. Okay? You want to start small and negotiate. So, so I think one of the things I think is difficult for several of us because we're librarians. And so when 
we are teaching, um, we've really been invited in by our faculty to come for maybe one session right. to teach students kind of a particular um, thing. And so we haven't had like that first day of class where we can right. say, these are the expectations. Right. And so I think for us, it's a, it's a trickier situation. It us. is. It's, very, it's a whole different ballgame. It really is. The best, the best you can hope for is that you'll have a very um, uh, in tune professor who will say, look, we're going to have some guests in this class, and we need to treat them respectfully. Uh, that's the best we can do. And then what's going to happen is going to happen. I mean, even though I give the big spiel about technology, I still wind up having to address that once or twice during the semester. So, and of course, what happens, this is what happens a lot of times, is that I'll say, okay, you can't use your, keep your phones on, on silent or on vibrate. Um, and if you need an emergency, if you have an emergency, you think it's going to happen. You know, you, you know, like, you know your sister's pregnant, is going to have the baby, you know, and you need stuff in the classroom, let me know ahead of time. But a lot of times I'll ask a question nobody will know the answer to. And sometimes it'll be a tricky question, and the student will, will have actually Googled it on his or her phone. And I'll say in front of the class, how'd you know that? That's wonderful. I say, I just Googled it, and it gets a huge laugh. Okay, and that's okay, and you work with it like that. I mean, you need to, you know, that's how you have that good working relationship with students. So, thank you. I have found that some students, like, say that, you know, they don't want to be babysat, say that they want, you know, be held responsible, but then when you actually do, you find out that they do want, like, I had a student <laughs> who was just very problematic in terms of chatting, in terms of, this is like, they're so, and one day I said, like, this is enough, I, I actually, because I had spoken to them privately, I emailed them about it, and I just, confiscated it, and I know that they actually complained um, that I was calling them out and embarrassing them. Um, like, and so, and then sometimes students like say, oh, I don't want to be babysat, but then, like, you know, this was, like, why, why didn't you email me a reminder that we had to bring this to class? And yeah. how do you deal with kind of students who are like that? That's a very good question. Uh, there always are going to be students like that. And, and it's always going to boil down to he said, she said, those kinds of things. Fortunately, they're in the minority. Most of our students, particularly at Auburn University, we're really, really spoiled, I think. We have really good, respectful students like that. But you're absolutely right. The only way to do that is to, is to see how the particulars of that play out and then respond accordingly. And, and you know, the problem with me being a psychologist, you ask me a question. The, I only have one answer. It depends. So you've got to know the particulars of the situation before we can give you any type of particular advice like that. Absolutely. Something like, oh, like, you know, it's a lot of the, the unhappiness is from students. Like, how do you deal with student to student conflicts in your class? Like, there was one student was complaining, and like, and this is true, like, the people in Chicago who were talking about it, and I said, you know, I've received complaints from other people, and then they just assumed it was her. It was actually correct. I didn't mention the name. Yeah. And apparently they were bullying her after that. Like, yeah. from then on, they were bullying her. Yeah. Like, how do you deal with, like, and then she would complain, or this a lot happens a lot in group work. You, know, like, you have, like, student to student conflicts. Again, the answer is it depends. But a lot of this can be prevented by having a really good set of etiquette rules beforehand. And you know, you may want to have even have a PowerPoint slide that when you're sort of going over what the group assignment is, just say, okay, here's some problems I've encountered with group work. Okay. And then talk about that quite frankly with students and how inappropriate that is, you know. But at the same time, talk about how important group work is out in the real world. Because many corporations, many institutions, they don't just say, hey, here's a problem. They say, here's a problem. You're going to have to work as a team. And part of, what you, part of, the reason, part of your rationale for having group work in your class is to sort of build that kind of teamwork and that kind of cooperation, particularly in your field. I mean, this is, this is a really important aspect of getting along in the grown-up world, absolutely. That's the best I can do for you. OK, thanks. Um, this is one of the reasons why I've never finished this presentation before, is because we get off into such these little interesting types of things. No, it's, this is perfect. These are the types of things you're liable to encounter when you're working one-on-one -on -one with a professor in a peer review situation. And you have to realize right up front that you do not have all the answers. So you really have to work as a team with this professor to sort of come at what you think might be a viable alternative for what has happened in the classroom. And you'll find that a lot of times you're, it's going to work dead on. There are going to be some times where you've got to go back to the drawing table a couple of times. You're not perfect. You're not perfect as a teacher. You're not going to be perfect as a peer reviewer. I've been doing this. Amaz has been doing this. Jim has been doing this for a long time. 
And we're going to have perfect days, but we never have perfect years. Okay? It just doesn't happen. And a lot of times that perfection is just a result of dumb luck. Okay? Just dumb luck. You do, you do the best you can with the resources you have and hope for the best. But the things I'm talking about here helps us all hedge our bets. It helps us make our own luck, so to speak. So let me, let me return back to the, to the uh, qualities of, of good peer reviewers and talk about when you're observing, you not only want to take a look at what the teacher is saying, but the physical context he or she is using. And we've already talked a little bit about hand gestures. But there's eye contact. There's physical movement. There's touching. You've got to be very careful with touching. Okay, very careful with touching. Okay, there's space, you know. You don't want to sort of get this kind of thing going on when you're that close. Stand back. Now, very interesting, Jim and I have uh, different approaches to, to one aspect. What Jim likes to do is there's a question from, from right here. Let me just preface this by saying I'm right and he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we get along so well. I listen to everything he says. Um, what I like to do, if Jim raises his hand, I'm going to take a couple steps forward so that the, the question asker knows that I'm paying attention. I'll listen to the question, and I usually either repeat it or I say, what? Did everybody hear that? And then I'm going to take a step back, a couple steps back, and I'm going to sort of start the question addressed to Jim and then sort of pan out otherwise. So that way everybody's included. Now what Jim does, so there's a little bit different function. Okay? He likes to sort of move to a position that's a little farther away. Because what does that make the student do? Speak louder. Speak louder. So both of them have their plus and minus. And then Jim does the same thing. He pays really good focal attention right here. Listens to the question, maybe repeats it. Because maybe the question was a little confusing. And so he maybe may repeat it, might ask the student to repeat it using a different language. And then begins to address the question by the same thing we do. Okay, so we, we have the same endpoint, but we get there two different ways. It's all a matter of individual style. And that's what you've got to realize. Excellent teaching comes in a great variety of shapes and sizes. Please. Yeah, well, just a small point. I was going to ask you about walking towards a person. So yeah. I'm teaching in a very long and narrow lecture room of 100 students this semester, and there's a whole bunch of stairs to go up. So I typically, I think, do walk towards students, but it's very strange this semester because, like, I would really have to hike. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it, yeah. like, it, take, it, would, it takes a while, right? So yeah. I find myself not really going yeah. to climb these stairs, and so the students at the back are really far away. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, if you actually climb, and if that's useful. Sort of in, I mean, I'm just wondering, since you say you, you do this. Yeah, um, I, was in a, I was up at the um, uh, Indiana, Indiana University, Fort Wayne, or Purdue University of Fort Wayne last week, and they put me in a lecture hall that was basically straight up. And by, by the time I was in there for an hour and a half talk, and I was like this the whole time, and I was actually had a sore neck afterwards. It was amazing. But I found myself only going about a quarter to halfway up. So you did go up the stairs? I do go up. Okay. But I don't go all the way up. <laughs> I don't go all the way up. Because not only do you have to go up, you've got to go down. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And in order to go down, I cannot go backwards down the stairs. Okay? I don't want to turn my back on the class if I can avoid it. So good questions. It may have, my, my thing may have died here. There we go. Okay, I got it. Thanks. Uh, Christopher Miller's online for anybody who knows Christopher Miller. Uh, what kind of what kind of techniques is the teacher using to deliver information, and are they effective? You know, you'll find that we have a lot of tools at our disposal. And one of the things you'll want to do as a peer reviewer over time is to learn what those different tools are. And again, like I said at the outset, there are a lot of really good books out there. You know, sometimes you may go into a classroom where the teacher is using problem-based learning. Maybe the teacher is using a technique called just-in-time teaching. Maybe they're using another technique called inner teaching. Maybe they're using classroom assessment techniques. Now, some of you may have never heard these terminologies before. Okay? So this is an opportunity when you peer review to learn about those in the pre-observation meeting. What kinds of approaches do you take to teaching? Okay. How do you handle questions and answers? Okay. Are they going to be doing any hands-on work in class? And if they do hands-on work, what is the teacher doing while those students are working in those groups? Is the teacher going around and consulting with them? 
Is he sort of listening in and maybe offering advice or something like that? Okay. These are all things you want to pay attention to, as well as the teacher's social skills. This is where it's difficult as a peer reviewer to make commentary because social behavior is personal. Okay. The language we choose, how we confront students, how we interact with them, this is really sort of touchy. And so to be a peer reviewer, to be a good peer reviewer, you've got to be able to have enough social skills of your own so that you can relay this information to the professor in a very palatable way. In other words, you have to, and I'm going to use very bad language here, you have to be able to slap them in the face and have them feel happy about it. Okay? Because sometimes you'll find, it's very rare, you'll find teachers who are doing something that's so offensive and such an affront that it needs to stop right away. You never interrupt the class. Now, if the teacher is, if, if uh, I was in an observation one time where a student passed out in the front row. This was long before Jim got here to campus. And the teacher just went on lecturing. <laughs> Fortunately, it was a psych class, so I got up and I attended to it. I said, you call 911. And I said, you stop what you're doing. This was a teacher. Take care, because the teacher was just going to go on. Okay. Only in those kind of life-threatening situations or, or uh, health situations do you have to ever interfere. But most of the time, you're just a benign observer in the back. And a lot of times, you're back there, people have forgotten about you. People have forgotten about you. Sometimes, if you're in your own discipline, I've had this happen, the teacher actually calls on me to address a question. And that's one thing you do in the pre-observation meeting. You say, you know, you're not here as a student or as a colleague to be part of the class. So I won't be answering any questions, those kinds of things. You're also paying attention to the students. Are they fidgeting? Uh, what are they doing with their technology? What's, what's going on in this computer over here? Okay. So what, you, know, you can know if a student is sitting down and they're like this, you can pretty much bet that they're texting. Okay. <laughs> is a teacher allowing that to happen? Now sometimes teachers don't mind that. And what you'll find is that sometimes you'll provide advice or an observation to a teacher that will be irrelevant to the teacher. You are, after all, in this capacity, an advisor. You are simply offering suggestions and ideas in concert. Okay? But you can point out okay, what the consequences are for students and students sitting around them who are mis misusing technology. So you need to pay attention to all those sorts of things. Okay? Sometimes I'll be in a class and I'll say, you know, I know none of the students took notes. Why is that? Okay? And they'll say something like, oh, because I give up my notes ahead of time. They're just coming to class to sort of hear me elaborate. And I'll say, how's that working for you? And sometimes the teacher will say, oh, it works great. And some teachers say, well, you know, my grades are so bad. And I'll say, what well, do you, you think maybe there's a connection between students not taking notes and not learning what you have to say in class very well? Oh, I never thought of that. Okay, sometimes things just are not obvious. And I've done the same way when I've had peer reviews done. Things that are not obvious to me sometimes, the peer reviewer point out, I think, I can't believe I kept doing this. I've been doing this for 25 years at this point. How could I not know I was doing this? Okay. When you are providing feedback to a professor <coughs> or a graduate student in a peer review situation, you need to realize that this, that particular individual is probably a little bit anxious, especially if this is a first time observation. So you want to be very gentle. Okay? You want to pay attention to how is the professor reacting. And if you see the professor is squirming and reacting and, and really nervous, you want to back off and just say, you know, am I, is this uncomfortable to you? And they won't be very frank. They'll say, yes, it is. Well, let's talk about that. Okay? And then that's a chance for you to remind them that this is a formative assessment and not a summative assessment and that you're going to keep this information confidential. Because a lot of time that's the problem. That's what the problem is. Sometimes you may want to remind the professor of that or the students of that right off the bat when you sit down and begin the post-observation meeting. So pay attention to that individual's body language. Okay. A lot of times 
You want this to be a conversation and not a lecture. So that rather than saying, okay, here's what I observed, here's what the students had to say, here's my recommendations, you begin a conversation. So you ask questions. So sometimes the teacher will say something during the post-observation meeting, and what are you doing? You're sort of saying, well, you know, could you, could you tell me more about that? That's really interesting. Could you explain that? Okay. Oh, now, sometimes I'll say, oh, now, now I see your logic. I understand why you did that in this particular class. Does everybody know what reflection is? Jim is a master at reflection. He has a, a, a background in counseling psychology. So the idea is, is to sort of... Don't ask me now, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so are you saying, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> Take time, like you would do as a teacher during a lecture, take time out to summarize, even briefly, what, what you've covered so far. You know, a good way is if you're using this, um, this checklist, it's just sort of, you know, do it in thirds. Talk about content and delivery first, and then when you're done talking about content and delivery, you say, okay, let's just sort of come up for air and see what we've talked about so far. Okay. Sometimes I will say, okay, you know, we've, we've talked about this, you know, you're, you're doing these things very, very well. There's a few things here that you might want to work on. How, do, how are you going to start that? You know, what, do you, what, do you, what do you want to work on first? So you never leave a uh, post-observation meeting without asking the professor to think about how things are going to change in the future. What are you going to do? We might call them action items. Okay. We might call them action items. Well, can I interject something? Please. Um, something that I also do is very similar to this. Before I even start to communicate and share my feedback, I ask the instructor to reflect on one, what they think is going well in the class, what they think students are going to say. So I have them reflect on their perception of how the class is going and what students are going to say before I share their perceptions and what they say. And it's sometimes uncanny how knowledgeable they are. They know what's happening. They have a sense of what students are going to say, even before I share it with them, but yet they were still doing things you know, that students wanted them not to do. But they, were, they were aware of it, but maybe they just couldn't understand how to change what they were doing. So I, I do interject that reflection yeah. part even before the Yeah, sharing. That's a great strategy. And that way it gives you an opportunity to say, you know, to, to begin the discussion without you having to seem like a heavy. That is to say, without you having to come down hard on them because they're aware of it. Now the idea is, okay, what can we do to improve that situation? So it's a really good stepping off point. Yes. We're almost out of time. Okay. We're almost out of time. Um, I'm going to cover about two pages. I'll do it fairly quickly. And then we're going to uh, conclude. You'll have an evaluation to do. And one of the things you should say is you didn't finish your presentation. Okay. So if I was in a post-observation meeting with you and you were to say, well, how do you think you did? One of the things I would say is, I didn't get through it again. I didn't get through it. <laughs> Couple of things. When the teacher is reflecting, you don't want to interrupt. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You don't want to sort of come off like that. You don't want to say, but, 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 but. Okay? Let the teacher finish. And then very gently, very kindly say what you need to say. We have definite ideas about how things should be in our classrooms. We have to realize, though, that that's not the only way to do it. So what we don't want to do in a post-observation meeting, a feedback situation, is to impose our will and our ideas at the total exclusion of what that individual is doing. Because it could be that the individual is under some really good things, it's just that's not the way we would do it. That's what I mean, you, you can't be judgmental. Okay. You may really feel comfortable in a particular approach, and it may not be working so well for you, but we want to find out how it might work. So what a good peer reviewer would do is to help you brainstorm about ideas for how it may work. 
and then say, you know, if those don't work, here are some other ideas as well. Okay, this is the last page I want to share with you. These are the different ways in which you can interact with another human being in most situations. We can counsel them, we can explain to them, we can evaluate them, we can uh, ask them questions, we can reflect, and we can self-disclose. What we find in a peer review situation is that the most effective ways of carrying on this discussion when we're providing feedback are the ones in which you see a preponderance of X's. You want to take them out of the situation of, of evaluation. Okay? You don't want to use words like, you must, you have to. That was really bad. Okay? You want to avoid that kind of language. You want to be more suggestive. You want to sort of let them come to their own conclusion. This is not unlike raising children. You know, you don't want to give your children all the answers, but you want to lead them to it. Okay? Let them think it's their own idea. That is a very successful way of doing peer review by simply hinting and suggesting. Sometimes, you know, you got to go upside the head with a two by four, but those are the rare cases. So, lots of questions. Okay, that's what Jim does. Starts off with the questions, gets them to reflect, and then you can sort of reflect back to them what they're saying to you. Sometimes, you know, a lot of times I found myself saying, um, you know, I found myself in a similar situation. I, I would always have these like two or three people that would form this little clique down front and they would talk. You know, and I would struggle with it. I didn't know how to handle it. Do I confront them directly? Do I call them out of class? I was in the same situation. What that does for you is it says, I have experience with the same thing. You, it sort of establishes a connection, a relationship with that professor. So then you can talk about how you approach it. Sometimes I actually haven't been in that situation, but I've had a colleague who has been. And so I could say, you know, I had a colleague, or I, had an, I did an observation over in um, um, astronomy. And this is, this is how the situation was revolved, uh, is solved. So. Do a little bit of counseling. You know, that's where the suggestions come in. Okay. Uh, you don't want to get the situation where you're, in a lecture, you're lecturing them. Okay. This is a two-way conversation. So what we've done is we've covered... What I consider to be, and I think much, many of the Bigio Center considers to be, the fundamental qualities of a good peer reviewer. We've given you a couple tools, okay, in terms of this checklist, in terms of thinking about uh, the kinds of things that you should be looking for in a peer review situation. And I would be more than happy to um, continue our conversation via email, um, in any way I can to help you with the teaching. As I said at the very outset, the Bigio Center. Uh, is in a great position to provide peer reviews and more sessions on peer reviews and to meet with you individually about how peer review can be done. What I would suggest is if you haven't been peer reviewed by the BGO Center, that you go through that process first before you start doing peer reviews in your own department. That will really sort of see what it's like to be on the learner's end of it. Okay, and you'll learn a lot from it. Um, I promise you one last handout. Say, Mod, I'll have you do that. This is the entire PowerPoint presentation. And I thank you very much for your time and your interest, your questions, and your participation. I don't know if everyone got the sheet. It ended up back here. Okay. Anyone didn't find it. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I find this online? Okay. No. No. Oh. no. Thank you. Thank you. Who, do, who, do, who needs to sign up? Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you all for coming, Bill. Thank you for sharing your experience. And thank you. I just want to, one last uh, time, remind you that this is available online. So there is an article on peer review in this book, this whole book. We downloaded the book, so you can download it. It's a, um, from the American Psychological Association. It's a free ebook for you on effective evaluation of teachers. I'll pass this around. Thank you. Look at it if you'd like. Uh, URL, I believe, is on. I don't know where to be. It's uh, teachpsych.org. Teachpsych.org, and you go to the ebook on the left hand menu, and you, you will find it there. And what was the name of the website? Evaluation of Teachers.